morning, everyone. We are here and we are bi coastal. We have the coast against the West. I love it. 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 So, welcome everyone to Women in the Family Offices. Uh, we are honoring Women's History Month uh, for the month of March here. So, I'm so honored to have my friends in the room. Um, this is exciting. And we were just debating that. Are we at three on Desiree on octaves? So where we're going to go and multipliers and Marty, we said, okay, bring it together. We're going to get it done. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Wendy. Uh, so Wendy, we met what, six years ago now, seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, at least maybe even longer um, at a family office in New York. And um, we have been come fast friends. And the excitement of what happened is, is that I'm like, here she is by herself, very rare having women in the same room. And I walked up to her and I said, girl, I got to get to know you. And ever since then, we have always chimed each other, figured out what's going on in the value add. But this woman knows everyone in the world is in the family office space, her energy, her ability, and her desire to help people, to desire to help everyone that she meets, the, not only in the family side, but the people who are coming in to energize each other. And that's the value is, is that this whole thing is about supporting each other, helping each other, and most importantly, leveraging the resources to help our ecosystem to become more sustainable and also to have a greater quality life. So welcome, Wendy. Thank you. So I'd like, hey, so tell us a little about yourself. Uh, tell you how life has been the last year since COVID has hit and the excitement. You just had a ripping party last night and you are so energized <laughs> off the chart. So take it away. Uh, so I run a single family office in New York. And that's my primary day job. And then I'm involved in other ventures with other one other participant here on the on the webinar. And COVID hit hard. I actually landed back in New York on March 8th and we were locked down by the mm -hmm. 13th. Uh, schools closed, couldn't leave your house. It was really crazy. And I didn't have a lot of time to get supplies in and um you know, we had had help in the house because I traveled and we had to let help go, which was sad, but you know, COVID, I think in New York, we were hardest hit early on yep. um, and our transmission rates were almost close to 20% and we suffered over 30,000 deaths in the first few months. So it was very bad here um, in ways I don't know that if you weren't here, you really can't appreciate it, it was horrific. So we really did have to lock down. Um, so I went from flying and packing and carrying my little roller bag to cleaning toilets and going, oh, not only do I have to cook every night, I have to cook three times a day and algebra. I haven't done algebra in 45 years. <laughs> I, and they do it very differently than they do now. And um, and school's very different than it is now. And my kids had never done online school. They're seventh graders. And so we're trying to get through the tech piece of getting them hooked up because the schools weren't prepared for it. Um, and then the homework and can I sit in my room? Where's my quiet place? How do I get supplies in the house? I mean, it was just literally dropping every single thing about my life and picking up this whole new life. And I'm not yeah. going to say it was good or bad. I certainly had always regretted not having um, enough time with my family. I no longer regret that after one year, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I was feeling the typical mother guilt because I traveled so much and I was always working. And you know, for the first six months, it was truly um, a blessing to be able to be with them and see what they're interested in and who their friends were. And, and then it kind of changed by the end of the summer. And I think a lot of people were hoping that things would start to go back to normal. And it became very obvious that it was not and that we were gonna have a very long run of it. And friends started dropping off. It's hard when you're 12 to make friends online. <laughs> You know, um, so they started yeah. really feeling the stress of that. We were feeling it with, you know, our work environments all stuck in the house. So it was very difficult. Um, I will say that this month things are opening up um, and I'm in New York. So, I mean, that's, that's saying something that it's opening up. We're at a great cocktail party uh, put on by Jaboy last night uh, down uh, 
down in New York City. There's a lot of conferences coming up, which is exciting. And I, I just, it was so amazing to see my friends. I've never gone a year without seeing my friends. And yeah, there were a few tears there last night. People really, really had missed each other in a way that we hadn't really delved into before. Before it was just like, oh yeah, we're all part of the space and we all see each other. And now all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I've missed your jokes. I've missed your laugh. I, it was just great. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, we're starting to work our way out of this um, a little bit. And I think we'll see a lot more of that in the summer. And I know most of the providers have conferences planned for the fall. Um, I love my children and I literally cannot wait to go to a conference and take a bath for two hours without anybody banging on the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and eat a dinner with every, where everybody is over the age of 18. And, <laughs> and nobody's saying, wow, that really sucks. I don't like that. You know, and, and I don't right? like to cook it. I am just so excited. And I feel more hope and excitement. And then I felt in a really long time. So it's a good place to be. That's excellent. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, you said you wanted something that nobody knew, even you. So for three years straight, when I was a teenager, I worked on the Appalachian Service Project in Kentucky and Tennessee and West Virginia, where we literally went up into what they call haulers, and we were helping them put insulation in their homes, building outhouses, siding houses um, for folks who had next to nothing. Right now, you can't do that because you can't have folks on site, but it was probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. And very few, if any people know that I spent three summers doing that. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. Well, that explains a lot of your giving. I mean, I have you, Deanna and Marty are always giving. I think that's, what's the most important thing that's on every, all of us that are on this right now. The fact that we give back and that fact we're always sharing. I mean, that's a huge human element, but the fact of being all of us are mothers and the fact that we all care for our society and where we work um, and play. And you, you have, in my opinion, Wendy, have really honed in the fact that you went from a family to around the world to a family, your own family, but you still had to work about the dynamics. You're never too big or too small to work on every little thing that needs to be done. Um, and all of us love our kids. At the same time, we all love our independent freedom to go help and get things done. So I think that dynamic of having significant others and people who support that cause is huge. So thank you. So I'm going to let Wendy introduce Deanna um, and where that went. I know that I met Deanna because of Wendy and the very first conversation we had literally in what, two minutes? We were like jamming, like we known each other for 20 <laughs> minutes. So it was yeah, like it was like two hour call. It was supposed to be like <laughs> intro, two hours. Right. How, how many, <laughs> how many Already just went so Right. Uh, oh, forget him. Oh, my my client, my investor just called. Okay, forget him. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what was happening. It was. Oh, I'll call him back. That's right. Take it away. Oh, okay. So uh, Deanna is going to speak next. Deanna and I have become we were friends always, but we came, became really close during the pandemic and we were sharing a lot of things. And like the one person I could reach out to on really happy days and really sad days. And she still took my calls. <laughs> Which is always. <laughs> and You're my sister just, from another mister. I'm telling you, I'm <laughs> telling you. And, and she's just really high energy. And sometimes you meet people in the family office space where you just, it's hard to explain, but you just know that they can, they're not only can fit in, but they're a welcome addition because the energy they bring, um, how caring, how compassionate, and might I say brilliant. We always talk about women and say, oh, women are caring, we're cohesive, we, you know, help each other. You almost never see, or they, if they have a women's panel, it's always about, um, I always call it the kumbaya issues. You know, let's say it. There are some women out there who are brilliant in finance, just brilliant, and the mechanics, and gender has nothing to do with it. Deanna is brilliant. I find her mind brilliant when it comes to structuring things, and it's just truly been a pleasure. Deanna? You're going to make me cry. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, uh, she, she does. She does do that when you're not on the line. So, Wendy, so she truly is an incredible lady. I mean, we've had some serious conversations, and so... 
Uh, I could not have asked for a better introduction. And um, thank you, Wendy, for that. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I love Wendy. <laughs> and that's for real, you know. Hugs, hugs, my, hugs. <laughs> is my friend. And you, you be my friend. I be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> we sit out in the south. You be my friend. So um, that was awesome. I don't know that. I don't know if I could say anything after that. That's pretty awesome. Um, so I have a family office, and one of the things that we cater to is um, pro athletes and ultra high net worth individuals. And basically, Wendy kind of touched on what you know my where I get passionate is putting and structuring the right deals together because I'm always thinking about the safeguards and ring fencing in, you know, protecting the investors and protecting the project. So that's kind of what we do. And, and then I have um, L Family Office, which we're getting ready to launch, which is for women by women. And we can talk about that later, but that's going to be super fun. And um, and so during the pandemic, it was really, it was really difficult because I had to home help homeschool my son, which was a total flipping nightmare because I'm, I can teach adults. I just don't do very well teaching kids, right? It's just more like, just do what I told you to do. Sit down, do your homework and let's work on this and let's go line by line, right? So it's more kind of like a dictatorship than, you know, teaching. <laughs> do as I tell you not what I what, what you see me do but anyways um you know how that is so it was kind of a it was a little bit of a challenge seems like uh you know you're you're constantly trying to figure out ways toilet paper was a real big problem seems like for <laughs> four weeks I couldn't find toilet paper I was actually getting them from my neighbors a roll here a roll there you know and then finally I I scooped up like um, a package at Target. Finally, I actually you know, posted it because I was so excited that I finally got toilet paper. And that was awesome. And bleach, because I use a lot of bleach cleaning the house, right? And nobody in the house likes that, but I, I like the smell of bleach. It just feels fresh <laughs> and crisp. And not everybody likes that smell. So fun they fact. Do, they do now. They do now. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, it's burned up in their nostrils forever. Yeah. So fun fact about you. Okay. So when I was Wendy in high school. This. Wendy can't know this though. No, I don't know if Wendy does know this. I don't think anybody knows this actually. Um, when I was, when I was in high school, I was in, I was in acting. I, I actually started doing modeling when I was like 13. I was like recruited by John Casablancas. And so, you know, that was kind of fun in a mall, but um, so my acting teacher, when I was in high school, he comes up to me, he says, there's an audition that I want you to go on audition for. I'm like, like for what? He goes, a movie. And I said, okay. He says, no, seriously, I want you to go do this. And I'm like, okay. So I did. I went and auditioned for the movie. And um, the, the lady who was the agent was, her name was Joe Farrell, which was called JF Images in Colorado, which is where I grew up, right? So um, she comes into the room and she's, you listen to me read and she keeps interrupting me. And I said, um, do you want me to read or do you want to just keep asking me questions? Because we can stop the audition anytime you want. And obviously I didn't have a lot of um, social cooth skills in those days, right? So I just kind of like no filter what I thought I said. So, you know, she and she was a redhead and she was really fiery. She was awesome. I flipping loved her. And so she, she says, um, do you have a contract? And I said, with John Casablanca, she goes, well, we're gonna have to get you out of that. So you can come over here and be with me. And I said, really? No, she's a, this was so cool, right? So this movie was a 5,000 audition for a movie called Sylvester in the 1980s. If anybody knows, that was with Melissa Gilbert, right? So these, the five, the 5,000 girls got down to 20. I was in the top 20, got down to the top 10. I was in the top 10. It became between me, Melissa Gilbert, and a, a, a model in New York. That is awesome. Ah, yes. But that, that actually started me doing movies and TV and I was on Perry Mason and Father Dowling and 
yeah so yeah and i i was in a movie with john with um kevin costner and he hates dobermans and i ran into him like a couple years later in jackson hole wyoming and i was flying in my boyfriend was a, pi a private pilot so we were flying in on the comb side and we were coming in and he looked at me and i said wait are you kevin costner he said yes he goes you're the girl at the dobermans i had Do dobermans <laughs> one, right? i go you remember me he goes Yes, I hate Dobermans, remember? And I said, yes, I, I do remember that. So that's a little fun fact. How cool that is. That is fantastic. All did right. You, I don't think you did know that, did you? <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> See, this is what this is about. So we did an actual ad on toilet paper. We put dripping gold on it to emphasize <laughs> that the fact that toilet paper <laughs> It was the same as gold and literally did a shrine and toilet paper. <laughs> I know one of my favorite things that kept getting reposted was the toilet that was all like a giant shrine with toilet paper. That was my favorite one. I was like, I think it's that one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get that out circulated part of this because we did it as part of the, we did a whole uh, magazine on on COVID and what it was like and during what there and, and that we had one of those pieces in the mag. It was unbelievable. So thank you. I love it. So we're gonna bring it back home. Uh, we have Marty in Newport Beach. I'll go ahead and introduce her. Um, I actually met Marty, gosh, probably six, seven years ago myself at a function. And it was one of the ladies that I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get together with her. Yes, I am, yes, I am, yes, I am. And all of a sudden, here we are at the lockdown. LinkedIn comes up and I see her post and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is Marty doing? So I said, Marty, let's catch up. And she says, sure. She puts her email right on LinkedIn. So everyone can see like, okay, here I am. And I'm oh thinking, my gosh. okay. And so she, I follow up with her and I said, and we sit down and we hit it off again. And I was just like, okay, this is fantastic. So she runs, uh, she's part of the nonprofit for her first foundation for the philanthropy work for the family offices. And I remember her always saying, Desiree, get your application in before November. That's our deadline that we have to have everything in. What's going on? And so welcome, Marty. Unbelievable. She's the one that helped us with our new tagline, Elevate Women, Bridge Industries, Change the World. It's got to fit on a t-shirt. Otherwise, it's not worth remembering. Okay, thank you very much. So Marty, <laughs> take it away. Oh, well, Desiree, it was such a little ball of energy meeting you, I guess, is the best definition, but um, it was, you know, just the conversation that kept going. And um, I, it's just a pleasure to be here with everybody. I do work at First Foundation. I am in the philanthropy services group, so every day I get to help families with their, you know, philanthropic legacy planning, and I get to work with nonprofits to help with their building capacity. So, I always say, you know, I've got the best job in the company, but don't tell anybody. So um, I really love what I do, which is a lot of fun. And um, I'm also president of Advisors in Philanthropy, which is uh, at one point in my life, I said, okay, I need to have a defining sentence of what I'm on the planet to do. Like, what, what is my thing? And uh, at that point, it sounds really lame when I say it, but I said, I really believe that if high net worth people understood the impact of giving their money away, both on the organization, but more importantly, their own family, I think yes. they, they would get more. Like, I, I just have this feeling like if they only knew, if, I, if they only knew how much it can transform their own life and strengthen their family, they would do it. But no one, we're not talking about it enough. So, um, so that, was, that was my defining sentence that kind of launched me into this world. And the second thing that I saw was that one of the barriers to that is that wealth managers, CPAs, and attorneys who are the trusted advisors and who really have the ear of these families aren't talking about it. That's right. And um, so then I kind of got mad uh, because, you know, why is this not a priority? And then started looking into why it's not. And so the obvious showed up, you know, it's a time burner. Um, it's not their subject matter. They're not the subject matter expert. So it's uncomfortable sometimes if they don't understand what's happening. And then um, re realistically for some people, they say, well, I really am managing assets. So giving them away is not within a good um, you know, personal thing that I wanna do. 
And then, um, so looking at all those, so Advisors in Philanthropy is an organization that kind of tries to help with those areas. So we do education on how to do philanthropy well, and then create this amazing network of humans who really care about it. Because if you are doing philanthropy at a high level, you can't do it alone. You That's need right. an attorney to be able to help you structure it. And you need the um, CPA to make sure that you're compliant and doing it right. And you need a philanthropic advisor to help the family navigate it. And um, so everybody needs a wealth manager to manage the assets. So, um, so AIP is this wonderful place that I always say everybody in the room cares about something bigger than themselves. And, and so that has been my joy working with the people in that area. And well, I don't have kids at home back to the COVID conversation. So I feel I've, I've actually watched my colleagues and think I can't imagine how they did it. Um, I've got a kid in New York and a kid in Chicago. So, you know, watching them navigate COVID at a much higher level uh, was hard to watch. And at the point where at one point they were going to say that no one was going to go in or out of New York. I, ha I had that mother bear thing where I thought, I, you can't tell me I can't get my kid. I'm going to go get him. You know, he's a grown adult, but I'm, you're telling me I, my kid can't come out of New York. I don't think so. So uh, that's kind of the stress that, you know, COVID hit um, for us. And then when my son did come home for a visit, it was interesting to watch him. He kind of had some anger management issues at first because he, he said, Trapped. you people, I always love the way he talks to me, you people, you don't understand what we've been through. And he was, he's, you know, we're <laughs> on the boardwalk at Newport and everybody's sitting on the beach without a mask. And he just wanted, you know, it was like he wanted to scream. It's not fair. So our experience on the West Coast has definitely been different than the big cities. And um, so I am working at home, which I love. I really don't want to go back to the office. I really like working from home, but we will go back eventually. And so fun fact about me, I, I don't, you know, I was thinking probably the biggest fun fact about me was just before I turned 50, I went on a serious quest to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life and spent um, a good chunk of time really exploring you know, if there's no kids involved that I need to care for anymore, what was my life going to look like? And um, through that exploration, completely pivoted everything and changed into this new area of work, which I'm really grateful for. Wow. Amazing. Very cool. So, Wendy, what's so exciting out the window that you are just jamming about? You're just like, oh, my God, is the kids running away? I want to know. <laughs> the kids out there just going <laughs> to... We have some deer out the window and they came down very close to the patio. <laughs> I was checking them out. I love it. But see, that see, that is so cool because you know, I saw yesterday on a channel up in Tahoe where a bear jumped in that got the, the family had set up the, the, the jacuzzi to literally turn it on to get it to warm up so they could go outside, right? And the bear comes up the stairs jumps in the jacuzzi and sits there for 15 minutes. A full grown grizzly bear. We're not talking oh about you. With the pandemic, we the wildlife, I mean, especially last coming summer, down. came back. And still, I still see this. And, you know, we there was always deer up in the woods, but they never came down that low. So I was like, how close will they come? You know, this is kind of cool. I just said when we were, one time when we were like six years old, we, we were driving up to Mesa Verde. We used to live in Colorado, right? I grew up there. And so we always took candy. My dad is a candy freak. So we had these maple nuts. My dad loves maple nuts. I like them too. And so we decided we we're going to pull over on the side of the road. And there was this deer, was a whole bunch of deers that came out. And I was sitting in the car and I was holding the maple nuts. And they came into the car and was eating the maple nuts out of my hands. That's wild. Cool little deers i'm like oh can we take one home dad no we can't do that <laughs> no i remember dog. i remember camping and my older brother uh we had squirrels everywhere in montana and literally held his hand like you said the nut and the squirrel came right out of his fingers and just started eating it sitting there they came back they will. And more and you're just like and now you know okay the diseases and this and this and this and i'm just like you know 
if we live in constant fear of everything we do or touch, you, you know, won't do anything. You know, and and not that you know we gotta take the crazy risk of jumping off the side of a cliff, but the idea <sighs> is that we have to have some kind of of care to go with it. So very cool. So if we really look at the families and, and really look at, you know, we're all human beings. And Wendy has said this time and time again. Well, Desiree, I want to, I want to hear your fun fact. Like I want to yeah, hear yeah. about yeah. you. Ah, okay, my Come fun. Come on. Okay. You want to put us on the spot and not her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who's right. going to introduce me? Okay, Wendy, you can introduce me. Okay, all right. So in first, I just want to say I have jumped off the side of a cliff, so it's not crazy. <laughs> um, so Des Desiree has, has um, been my friend for many years, and um, she always comes up with a way for people to be collaborative, and, and with a focus on women, but not just women, uh, and, and in a way that I don't usually see. A lot of times people are like, oh, I have this or I have that. And what are you doing? And, and, and we really get to take a breath, slow down and not to say she's not high energy. She's got more energy than I do, but to take a breath and say, how can we work together and do some good with that? And how can we take this group of people who are great people and let other no people know about this great group of people and then increase our group? She has inspired me. She, she's, you know, had ups and downs in her life like anybody, but you wouldn't know it. She is so positive, so upbeat, so warm and welcoming. And when I think of Desiree, the first thing that comes to my mind is big, warm hug. Wow. Thank mm. you. Isn't that That's awesome? Cool. Right? Mm. Oh my gosh. So like, Lindy, like Deanna, I'm going to cry. Oh my gosh. So thank you. Thank I know, you. right? She gets well, you right here. Right. I mean, I remember it, and we were at the grand, uh, we were at the uh, terminal and, and we were, um, and you were telling me about all the work you were having done and just all on our teeth. Uh, right? Yeah. I all remember the, that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not showing my teeth. We're not going there. Um, I've had extensive work on my mouth. So I was like, you know, feeling the pain and the joy and the, and the love and everything else. So thank you. Thank you. So for me, um, the pan the pandemic and dealing with COVID was a very eye opener for me because I was so excited to have after that incredible conference we had in 2019 um, in Pasadena that Linda got all her awards and and congressional awards and everything and and as a leader in the family office space we were going to have it in Tahoe and I was so dead set to have this incredible environment that we were going to bring the life and the energy into the into the mountains and have this environment that we could sit for three days and really enjoy nature and get down to the core. And when that had to get postponed because of here, I'm in Irvine and we had, um, we got hit hard back in December. So it was after. And so you had got hit very hard in New York. And as a visionary strategist, I was seeing things that were happening. I said, oh my gosh, the civil unrest, the ability, I said this two years ago, that we were going to see a lot of changes and it was overwhelming for me. I had to literally take a pause and go, I see the way the world's starting to go. I understand the currents that are happening. How am I going to adjust and be a positive person on a daily basis? If I can't internalize it, be strong, how am I going to take an external one? And my gift is when I go and meet people, I'm always high energy. And I love to come and be myself to where I get dolled up. I have, I love my clothes I've collected of 50 years. Um, I still pride myself that I could fit in something that I bought 40 years ago and go, yes, I got this. Oh, my hips after four kids, I can't make it work. Um, and so it's exciting. I mean, Wendy's always like, girl, like, are you serious? Like how much luggage did you bring? I'm always hauling my luggage around, you know, having 200 pounds and people are like, You've got to be real girl. No, that's how I keep my muscles going. That's my working out to get on the airplane. And I love that about you because I, I, on the other hand, now can take a week's worth of travel gear and put it in a carry-on because I just can't do go that. there anymore. And so I'm always so impressed that you can do that. You look like you just stepped off a set. It's amazing. Now, I, my luggage is massive, huge, and it's like a mosaic picture. So it doesn't ever get, well, it does get lost, but... That happened one time in Dubai, but <laughs> I never, I never not miss it because it doesn't look like anybody's, but it's like 500 pounds. And I, cause I gotta have room for my pillow and all my shoes. <laughs> okay, so I can have 
average anywhere from eight to 10 pairs of shoes per weekend trip because I have to have shoes that change per- I do too. Outfit. I have different shoes for different outfits and there could be like four or five pairs or six pairs that I'm bringing for like three days. And the purse has to match. The coat has to match. I have the same. It has to have an under thing. The jewelry has to correlate. And then yeah. depending on what kind of layers, if I have to wear a hat or gloves or scarves, all has to coordinate, right? Yep. See, girl, oh, you my coordinate my clothes. are you kidding me? I have a basic black shirt, a basic shirt, and that's all I'm carrying. <laughs> no, more. can't do that. My husband can go in one of those little tiny bags. Uh, my son and my daughter can do that, but I, my husband's like, every time I have to go travel with you, it's like five bags. Because I have the- Wendy, Wendy you and I are going to travel one, together. And then I have a backpack <laughs> yes. and a purse. Without a doubt. Wendy I and I are traveling together. We're already through security. We're yep. in the cab. We're, we're already there. <laughs> you guys are getting your luggage. Yep. The uh, first time I wore a skirt, I actually had purple leather outfit for Desiree's uh, award ceremony. And she was so shocked that I wasn't in a black suit with flats. Right? I, I think she fell off the podium. You were stunning. You were unbelievable. I would die to see her in a purple mini skirt. I didn't say mini skirt. I said skirt. Okay, okay, okay. Deanna, they're all live. They're all on in one. They're on YouTube. The entire <laughs> conference is on YouTube. I've got her dancing. I'm downloading it. I I've got her dancing. I've got her getting her awards. I've got her interaction. Oh, uh, girl, I've got it. Brian, everyone. It was fun to talk. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Oh, God. Uh, so the idea was, oh, yeah, she was, uh, she she said, I actually feel good about it. She says, I wear it. She's like, this is cool. And everyone she knew that came up to her like, Wendy? Oh my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? We had Look so at you, you're in a skirt. <gasps> Legs. It was, it was huge. So anyway, back to the luggage. So the idea was having all this stuff there is to me makes me feel energized because I feel young being that. You know, I turned 60 last year. That was a big deal in November. Um, and so moving forward, I said, what are we doing? You know, who's my strength? What's going on? And that's where we, uh, Marty and I really started digging in. And, you know, what am I doing? How am I doing? Where, where is my modeling of, of not only the business, but what can I give back? Because I feel like I'm isolated because I can't travel. That was the biggest thing for me. And so that being said, my true self of energizing on stage, I felt like I was sitting in a box, the monotone of talking, not moving, not, you notice I talk with my hand, you see the visual going that crazy. But I said, just do what you are, feel, feel like you can stand up, you can move, you can run, you can do everything as if you're on stage. And with that being said, I had to get back into dressing up. I had to get dressed to where, I mean, you can't tell, but the idea is, is that I had to start fixing myself up on a regular basis to feel like I was still traveling, being back that normality. But what happened is, is that I started saying, because my kids are grown, my fourth one moved out in November, the day after Thanksgiving. That was a total shock to me. Like, it was like, like you talked about, you know, what are you going to do before you got on the call? How do I feel when I'm going to be an empty nester? Well, Marty is, I am now, and both of you do have, you know, teenager age type. Yeah. Uh, five years. The sentence is five more years. <laughs> Let me warn you, Wendy, it's going to get even worse as you get older. I mean, they just, it never stops. Not if they can't find me. <laughs> That's funny. I, 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 I you keep changing your cell phone number. <laughs> you figured out yet? I'm avoiding you. We moved. Didn't we tell you? <laughs> we, we forgot to tell you. We told everyone this is we fun and energy. You notice how we're just going crazy here, but that's okay. Here, Wendy's drinking Coke and, and Energy Flies and Deanna's drinking water and I got a little bit of coffee, but rooted by three times of coffee. And then Marty's got a straight coffee and she's just buzzing along. She's got an amazing big cup. I like her cup. Mm -hmm. you know, I have those big I don't mess around. cups too, because you got to be double fisted drinking those bad boys. Right. And my coffee is really unique. Because, okay, so I don't know if you guys saw my little story about Chubani, but some weeks, some months ago, because of COVID, uh, I always drink the Oreo cookie, International Delight creamer, right? Oh, that's right. You told me about the story. <laughs> so they, they stopped making it. I was oh. furious. So it took me like three weeks to find a new creamer that could like be an equal to International Delight's Oreo cookie. And I found Chubani cookies and cream. 
I was like, oh my God, this stuff is the bomb. I had like, I got as many of them as I could at the store. To totally like wiped out, took all like three or four of them. Took me like about a week and a half to get rid of them, you know, drink them. And then <laughs> I go back the next week, very next week to go get them. And I'm like, where, where, are, where's the cookies and cream, Chibani creamers? Oh, oh, it's discontinued. I said, what? I just found it. And she's like, yeah. So I, I sent an email to Chibani said, I'm in the fetal position in Publix alleyway in the refrigerator section because you've discontinued cookies and cream. Can you please bring it back? So they actually sent me an e they sent me a letter, a handwritten letter with a bunch of coupons. And I flip and called them. I said, okay, you guys, okay, you had me at the cookies and cream, but now you have me completely. And they have this vanilla that is awesome. So I just brought by chocolate um, syrup and I mix it with the with the vanilla and some cookies and cream. So I have a big, big cup that I have every day, like three times a day. That's where my mojo is, not the five hours, girlfriend. <laughs> coffee. And you all think we're sane over here. This is a reality. <laughs> so let's get let's get down. So fun fact about me, gosh. Um, that's a tough one that no one knows about me. Um, I've said this before, so you probably don't, but I've had a huge fear of talking in front of people, um, that I feel completely inhibited that I can't step out of my cocoon and open my mouth because I feel that I'm not going to be liked. Um, I had this fear from being forth, first, if I could talk, um, and see how stuttered I started getting. Um, and so for me to get on stage, it took a lot of courage. And so now I thrive. I love it. I, I, the energy that comes into it. So I think it's the ideas of working hard to believe that you can do something and overcome our own fears. We become the best at what we do because of that, because of our passion and going. And one of the things is, is that if people see that you're passionate about it, they're going to love you and follow you because you're so passionate. You want to do it. So even though I go places and I'm, I'm like, okay, so what am I doing? What am I saying? Oh, here it is. Okay, fine. Let's do it. So that being said, it's probably one of the greatest things that happened to me that I still get very nervous, but I finally say, okay, no coffee, no nothing to stimulate me. Cause I'm already in high octane, get up there and just do it. So that being said, the still the fear factor of going up and saying it's harder for me to go up to someone and say, hi, Wendy, than it is for me to go on stage and talk in front of 5,000. The same people. thing. It's easier for me to get on stage and talk to 5,000 people than it is one-to-one. -one. Oh, I get it. I look at your eyes and I go, oh, I can't do this. Because <laughs> I'm like, what right? are your eyes thinking? You're like, what are you thinking? I like the eye-to-eye -eye contact. What? I'm right? watching you. What, what are you thinking? What are you looking at? Is there something wrong with me? I do something wrong. You're in my brain. Oh my gosh, to get out of here. <laughs> get out of my space, man. <laughs> She's gonna go like this. <laughs> I would I would have never guessed that about you, Desiree, for sure. Right? Me either. Yeah. I had the same problem. I had the same problem. Us redheads. It's probably right? the red hair. Because I had the exact same problem. When I used to, when I was in school and they would call me to answer a question, I'd start studying, stuttering. Because I'd be so afraid to say the wrong answer. I was like petrified, wow. right? I almost like pee my pants. I was so scared. And when I got to high school, I had an English teacher when I was a freshman and he says, all right, he used to call me sweet D. He says, um, I want you to go in front of the classroom and give your story. I'm like, I ain't reading my story in front of everybody. No flipping away. Cause I used to write poems all the time. Right. And you know, songs and stuff like that. Cause I thought I was going to be, you know, a rock star. And, uh, so anyways, he, he actually had me sing in front of the class, which is what he put, he was constantly putting me in front of the class, even if I made mistakes, so that I would get over my fear of speaking because he already knew my talent. So I find that your greatest fears is actually your greatest strength. Great, that's, right. that's, that's your gift. That's your, that's your actual area because the area that you get hit as hardest is the area that really you're gonna thrive. Because you work the hardest at to overcome your fears to make sure that you can yeah. excel 
And it's not about perfection. It's about the fact that you practice, 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 because you're always saying I could do better because I'm exactly like that. I hang on the fear of the word that if I say something, oh my gosh, did I say the right word? Did you take it wrong? Is, is, is that okay? That, I do that all the time. I get into my head and go, okay, so quit that. Just go with the fact if they're, if you think someone's saying anything, they'll let you know. If they don't, move on. You know, you yeah. got to get out of that, your system and go with it. So Wendy's going to make sure she's going to drop some zingers. Z Wendy can get into a room and she can start dropping some things. You just like, you just didn't say that. And she's, yeah, I did. <laughs> oh yeah, she does. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you why. I also, I had a hard time talking in front of people. I'm very much an introvert. Go ahead, laugh. But I really am. <laughs> um, I would rather be sitting with my Kindle in a little blanket somewhere and, you know, reading for 20 hours and doing just about anything. Um, and it was very hard for me to go up to people I didn't know. And it was very hard for me. Um, I got sick right before my wedding that the thought of being in front of people. Oh, and they had to funny. get me upstairs. My dad had to come get me. It was awful. And then I just got to a point where I said, this is crippling. I don't like it. And I've got to stop worrying if people like me or I don't. No matter what I do, there's always going to be some folks that don't like me. I'm not their cup of tea. And I can either spend the rest of my life killing myself to get that 20% of people to like me for somebody I'm not even, that's not even who I am, or I can just have fun with the people that are okay with me being me. And I would rather spend my remaining years on earth hanging out with people who accept me for who I am, who like me, um, who make me feel good about myself. I can make them feel good about their selves and, and the people that really aren't going to like me or think I'm silly or stupid or whatever the case is, nothing I could do is probably going to change that opinion. That's anyway. right. And I'm not going to put 80% of my energy into changing the opinion of a few. So it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't overnight, but at some point I just said, you know what, I'm just going to be me. And some people like me, some people won't like me. And hopefully along the way, I find some really dear friends and people I can work with that really enjoy working with me. And so, you know, opinions vary. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there like, I can't stand her. And there's people out there that say, I like her. And the uh, I love her. And <laughs> I love her. There's not one person that I know in the family office who does not love you. Everybody loves you. Everybody <laughs> respects you. Just so that everybody on so, this thing, everybody loves Wendy. With, Wendy, in, with that in mind, how did you navigate the family office space? Because it, it is male dominated. And, and how did you find your footing in that to do what you do? I very much care about family offices. And I care about them because I've been doing it for 20 years and I really see, you know, the pros and cons where they can be so helpful as you see where they get ripped off, um, all the different dynamics in there. And I just genuinely care. And I'm a nice person. I'm willing to help people if they need somebody to spend time and really talk to them about, you know, am I approaching families correctly or should we structure this PE event, you know, investment differently to appeal to families across the board you know, investment to legacy. And I just spent a lot of time and people realized that what they see is what they get. It's not a public persona. This is really me, um, <laughs> you know, all the way. And if they're okay with me being me, I'm fine with helping anybody. And if they're not, that's okay. Nobody's, it's like school. Nobody said we had to be friends, you know, <laughs> but Mm -hmm. I will always help people that need it. And that's kind of how, you know, I've just found my space in the family office space. And I've been there so long that most folks know me and they don't get, a, you know, offended by me being me. And, you know, it's good. I love it. What's and wrong? she's brilliant. And they love her. That's why. Because she's brilliant in exactly. running those offices. Yeah. There's nothing, she knows there's exactly nothing what to do to fix yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have this knack of knowing who to talk to and what to do to fill in the gap, to make things better. You, uh, you have a Rolodex that's endless and you're always thinking, I mean, here we get on the call. You're like, Desiree, as soon as we get done, make sure you call me because I have someone you want to meet. You know, that energy of always caring and helping and thinking of others is what makes you who's fantastic. And I have no, I know nothing that 
that you do or say that would what want anyone not to like you i mean there i i mean i'm thinking like you are you i mean maybe i could say that you need to eat i mean you have a very nice blue and white um shirt on today or blouse on and yeah <laughs> i'd say hey you're always wearing black but you know we could scarf you up and we could get you some accessories and get you some life babe that's new york you you have to wear black no 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 except no, for no. me I, when i go there leopard purple right no. So I will. I, I glow will walking down the street. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you guys a complete aside. And anybody who doesn't find this helpful, please turn off YouTube for a few minutes. So in New York, I, I started out in real estate before I went into family office, and I was an attorney. And that was back in the day when everybody at the closing table was a guy. Right? I was yeah. often the only woman there. Now, if I wore a colored suit, the first question is, "Oh, you're the real estate broker." Whereas if I wore a black suit with an ivory shirt, oh, you must You're be the one lawyer. of the attorneys. Yes. <laughs> and oh, interesting. That, that used to be how it was taken. And if you didn't wear a suit, you were treated very differently um, than if you wore a suit. And if you wore a colored suit, you were also treated very differently than if you wore a, we call it New York emasculating black suit. And so it just became habit um, to garner, to get people past my gender and any other preconceptions they had so we could just get down to business and do business. It just shut down that 30 minutes of, oh, so you have an education. We were done, right? The suit just said, yes, I do, <laughs> shut up, let's move on. Here's you know, what we're gonna be doing. Um, and, and it became habit. And now that I am in my 50s, I, I'm kind of moving back away from that because I'm more in a red hat society stage of my life where I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm wearing. If you don't like it, don't look. Um, so we are getting more colorful as I get older. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no, that's true. Because back in the eighties, it was, I worked for Citibank and other banks and I worked for a law firm. Right. And uh, I remember we had to go to this hearing and I needed to go with one of the attorneys and he's like, Deanna, you're not going to wear one of your short mini skirts, are you? And I'm like, yeah, I don't have any short, I don't have any long Everything was mini skirt, right? And you're yeah. talking about the 80s and the 90s, right? And big shoulder pads. Love that oh, stuff. Yeah. And I was full of color. I mean, I I had a few things that were black, but they were for the nightclub, okay? They weren't for the office. So I said, yeah, I'm wearing my mini skirts. I don't think you should come with us to the, the court unless you're wearing pants or a dress that's black, a black suit. And I said, okay. I'll see you there. I'll wear something. I wore a red jacket with black pants. There you go. Because I'm, I'm going to rebel against that whole thing. <laughs> right? And I did. But you know what? It became kind of like a staple. And then it started changing. People started changing. Even when I went to work for other banks, they always wanted you to wear those suits and the nylons. You had to sign, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I had to sign, um, in your contract, you had to sign an attire that you agreed to wear nylons with your pants and your skirts and your suits. You really? Yeah. Yes. Oh, this is this is no joke. I had a friend when I was doing my uh, my LLM. In you could get written up and fired for it. Right, and she was yeah. part of the interview group. She was coming over to get her LLM. She had worked for the FBI, and they had just done a round of interviews with women. <laughs> and they told me they absolutely declined to do a second interview with a woman because she didn't wear nylons and she should have known better. This was in the 90s, early 90s. And I oh, just yeah. remember yeah. being, you know what? This kind of sucks. Now I get it. Guys yeah, I, say I have to wear a tie, but it's really not the same thing. I defy a man to put on a pair of pantyhose. Oh, we'll talk about hate what's them. more uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I left the well, bank, I, I started my own business. That was the last time I ever wore a pair of nylons, and that was in the 90s. Yeah, Marty. so I, I think it's restrictive. Marty, sorry. Oh, no, I, I went to training at Johnson & Johnson back in the day, and it was a, they, we were launching a new product, so it was a huge training class, and um, we're all in there. And then three women from France showed up for the same training, and they were not wearing pantyhose. And let me tell you how. You what know, a scandal. It, it was scandalous. <laughs> It was hilarious how worked up everybody got that they weren't wearing pantyhose. And, um, but shake. yeah, we. <laughs> so 
I, do, so I don't remember, but it was, uh, I just remember that, you know, that, oh my God, they're not wearing pants. What the heck? They came in here, no, no nylons? What the heck? No, I know. So, it was right? a big deal. Women's History Month, everybody says, how do you get these opportunities or we need to encourage more women? Yet we're talking very realistically about fashion. We have to break that mold. Right? I've got a really good brain. Yeah. I love helping people. I have a great education and I just want to be able to go do my job. And yet I have to think about what am I wearing? What does yep. that say about me? Here, what? My husband has a whole row of suits and he just grabs one. It's Monday. You know, like, no, oh, I have to stand in my closet like you and go, what the heck am I going to wear? Yeah. Are so you caring like, more? Because you got to so go, I oh, that's, that's, okay. I need to put something on that's a little bit, covers up the shoulders or, you know, you have to be, I do a lot of business with men, right? So sometimes you have to be super careful that you're not wearing stuff that's provocative. Well, see, this is the nice thing about being 55, because I actually had, I was up at, uh, I won't say the name of the conference provider, but it was in the other Newport. And I had this 20 something wet behind the ears, must've just got his MBA this is two years ago. And I'm in my mid fifties. And he said, wow, you're really good looking. I was instantly apparent to me that he was on the sell side and he could tell from the color of my tag, I was from a family office. Um, and that he was thinking, you know, he had this bright idea, some early 20 somethings thing. Well, I'll compliment the old chick and she'll be so excited, you know, whatever. So I looked right at him. I said, you're really cute too. And I'm not going to write you a check. You still think I'm cute? And he went, oh, and he ran away. And I was like, oh. <laughs> that's why we love you, Wendy. You say what we think, but we just don't say it out loud. Oh, you started the me too thing. That was you. I got it. Okay. Just call it like it is. If that doesn't work, I go, you know, I'm old enough to be your mother, right? Yeah, and that's my line. Not a good approach to work with us. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. <laughs> so, Deanna, I want to hear how you started your, how did you specialize in athletes? How did that happen? Okay, so <laughs> this is really cool. Um, over the years, we've worked with some pro athletes, you know, like soccer players, football players, NBA players, right? And there was a common, there was a common complaint by athletes, right? And what, what's one of the staples of a family office? Caring about the investors, right? You got to care about the family that you're protecting. And so um, one of the things that's really sad that a lot of people don't realize or know about pro athletes is that many of them go broke after their contracts are up or they get hurt, right? And it's because... Wealth advisors do what they're best at. They manage what you're currently making and then they put them into their own company programs and products that yep. don't create wealth. They just sustain what you have. They just keep it, but it doesn't, it doesn't take away. It doesn't grow it, right? Not for a, lot, a good portion. So Deanna, be, be honest, you can say it. It creates fees for most of the managers. That's, well, they're not helping them. It's, it's, it's all about their motive, their 2% fee that they want to make. And that's yep. why they don't, in, that's why they don't advise them to invest in alternative investments, because that advisor is more worried about losing that 2% than he is about preserving the wealth of that family and creating yep. a generational legacy for that family. And if they put that first, then they would be doing a greater service for athletes, but they don't because it's selfish. And a lot of people that are dealing with the athletes, everything about them is self-motivated for their own financial gains. That's not why we have family offices so that we can get rich. That's not why. So I said, we got to, we got to help educate them on how to take a dollar and convert that dollar into four, six, eight, 10, 12, a hundred or a thousand, right? How do you do that? Well, you have to show them the basics. So I work with Pierre DuPont and I work with Olivia Cooper. What's their specialties? Trust, estate planning. They can put down the foundations that they need on order to protect their name, protect their, um, their family and create their legacy to go into the next generation and the next generation, right? So we don't do that. That's not my job. My job is to educate them and to get them to the right people who can help them. Just like I would refer them to you Marty on philanthropy. Okay. We can help him with that stuff, but that's your, that's your bag. Right. So 
the one thing then is we give them options where they can come in and they're gonna partner with us. They're gonna be involved in the due diligence. I'm gonna teach them how to take their money and create more wealth and then teach their wives and their children or their husbands about how do we take this and make a legacy for our family. And it, it's not about how much they have, it's about what they do have and being a good steward of it and then reproducing it into more. And so that's what we do. And you know, impact investing, um, giving them all opportunities. I'm passionate about farmers, mining, oil and gas, everything that has mm. to do with commodities because every single thing that's on your table, all your makeup, your hair products, all of that came from some farm or oil. That's uh, a question. I love, what that, if I, I love that business. I love it all. So and talk renewable to energy, alternative energies. I love that technology. And Wendy and I worked on bio biopharmaceuticals together. Talk about L. I want. I love that. I I want to have everyone here to make sure we know about L because the reality okay. is that if you think about the theme, women and in, in family offices. We need more. We need women to invest in women. We need yes. women to be not fearful of each other. Yep. We need women to understand the dynamics that to ask help is okay and not to be fearful of, of not asking. Um, and we need women to really come out of their cocoon. I mean, one of the things that's so incredible that just happened right now, we, we got so fun, but we also got real and we got stories out that people don't talk about. I mean, I can't remember the last time I talked about nylons, right? Right, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a big problem though. And it so was. it was. So some years ago, we, Wendy was actually, Wendy and Sheila Driscoll and another couple of, you know, several other ladies, we were in Dubai at a family office event. And Sheila, Sheila and I were sitting at a table and next thing we knew we had 12 women sitting there and they were all asking us, how did we overcome certain things? How did we deal with this pressure? How do we deal with this, you know, this, this conflict? And, and I remember leaving there, I called up Sheila and I said, we need to create a women's network because these are real serious questions that women are asking and they have no one to go to that's willing to just be honest and tell them, right? And because in the, in the eighties, it was more like women are doing it for themselves. It was like, I can't take anybody along with me because I have to build my own empire. It's, it's too, it's already hard enough just doing it for myself. I can't bring other women along with me. It was more like feast or be famined, right? You got to fend for yourself. So we ended up putting together and Wendy's been working with me for two years on it. And so Wendy and I and Sheila and some other women, um, we've come together and created L. And L is um, a family office network. It's for women by women. And there's 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 three things that we're going to do is we're going to deal with the emotional side and cycles where women um, we get trapped into these particular types of you know stereo, uh, stereotyping um, perceptions that we have to be this way, we have to behave this way, and it's wrong. It's not the right way, and it creates bad habits. But more than that, it creates destructive behaviors where it actually um, sabotages women who are who are leaders because they become a conflict with other leaders instead of working with them. Like all of us, we don't have any of that, but there's a lot of women that we've worked with and we know some of them in the family offices that you do not wanna work with those women. You don't wanna be in the same room with them because they tear down everybody. And why? Because they're constantly living in fear of losing what they've built or that somebody's gonna take away what they have. And if, if they would release that fear and release that, you know, I got to always protect myself, they, they'll never be the total person that they're supposed to be because they're always trying to protect rather than what they're supposed to do is lead. And a good leader knows how to be a good follower, knows how to be a good helper, right? And so we have to help women break down those barriers because there's a lot of those women that are very dynamic and they're miserable and they hate their lives and we got to help them. So that's one thing that we have. Then we're gonna have um, you know, philanthropy and foundations that we're gonna sow to, that we're gonna give to because we gotta help each other. And then we have a portal that's for um, women that 
um, if you have a project or a company that you're trying to build, you can put that into the portal and other ultra high net worth individuals, other found founders or entrepreneurs, what are they going to be able to do? Sow and invest into other women. And my idea and Wendy and I've talked about this. I'm like, I would love when we have a summit that we, all these women are sitting at tables of like 10 or 12 of them. And all of a sudden they've created a new technology. They've created a new business. Those 10 women sitting at the table saying, we need to do this. Let's do it together. And they create a business and it goes tops from that event at L. Oh, how That'd cool be- is that? That's just fantastic. I mean, inspire those women to, to go beyond their limits and, and break through their barriers. But we well, can't do it awesome. together. We can't do it alone. I love it. And in your the spot on of the ability to say that, you know, we're not being afraid to say that there's women who aren't supporting women. We are not being afraid that we need to ask for help because we're not perfect and we need to do it with others. You don't get to the top by yourself. You have to bring everyone along and give back. Yes. You know, look at the SPAC that just came out with Athena Technology Holdings. You know, the first women-led, women-owned, women-structured. And the fact that she rang the bell at the uh, New York Stock Exchange, I think it was a week ago, Friday, um, to actually have an, and I said, listen, she's got government space. She's in herself, proven herself multiple times. The people that they put together and they put it as a byproduct, the women met at a women's event to put this together, the, the three. I women. didn't know that. That's powerful, see? Right, right. And so Phyllis Jackson, who runs it, she's been 25 years in the government space to put that together. And I... I made sure that I posted on the, uh, the uh, made everyone know that I invested in the company because I want everyone to know that I, as a woman supporting another women's led company, and most importantly, I want to make sure that everyone knows that we have to start giving our own uh, capital to invest in these companies because if we don't, you know, it has to support the space is who's going to do it. So right. in, the federal, in the federal contracting space, only the, we all know the federal government is the largest employer in the world. Only 5% of the contracts once in the history of the U.S. has ever gone more than 5% to women-owned companies. There's a problem. I know, it's crazy. So whether we're, whether we're in the ultra high net worth, well, why aren't we figuring out how we're giving back? Like you're talking, Marty, about the philanthropy work, how to the fear of making sure that we can keep it investing and going and keep that sustainability. And that's where I think that, Deanna, this program that you have with Elle, is going to be so powerful because it's, you can't have, well, I don't know. Like I actually got, I'll, I'll bet off two days ago, I got a request from two guys, Desiree, I need your network to find two women who have run publicly traded companies of a billion dollars or more that I want to put on my advisory board. And you were there, Wendy, when we talked about that at our conference, or yep. I want to be a CEO, I want a COO of a company. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're my heart and soul that yep. this done to get it done because we need to fill that pipeline so having a a depository having something that brings that information out and you know we talked about the data analytics and we're uh am i okay with time with you we're two minutes over are we okay to continue for a few more minutes a few more minutes sure okay cool so you know desiree motormouth you know wendy we can get going we (laughs) talk for hours right so we get all right so the idea is that you know, the women, the women lost majority of the jobs during the pandemic. I don't care if you're ultra high, I don't care low. We lost that ability to connect and, and look at you. Both of you had to run your children and do online school. You're like, whoa, wait a second. This is not in my book. Oh, so frustrating. <laughs> so oh my God. The, I want to the, kill my kid. <laughs> We didn't say that. She probably just a bigger imagination. Like one of the one one of the one of the things she likes to say. She puts a, a word together. Dot com. Well, it's not quite the thing you want to send someone. So we want to talk what it is. We'll leave it alone. And it's an inside scoop. But anyway, so Q four of twenty twenty, men actually gained one hundred thirty thousand jobs. Women were the ones who lost the entire network of all the jobs in Q four of twenty twenty. So you think about that, where are we not supporting the women? And, and we're talking C-suite, we're talking all the way down the pipeline, and we're talking very uh, high net worth or very low, mainly obviously in the working class that lost their jobs. We have a reality check. We as a society have to help women, and most importantly, the women who have the accessibility, whether it's finances, or you have the, the network, or you have the bandwidth to support women and bring it to the light. And that's what I love about what we're all doing here is, is that we're coming together and saying, 
we need to support each other. We need to amplify each other and we need to make sure that we can help each other for one of those little lack of, 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 of growth because we're missing one element that can make that expo. So L, in my opinion, is like, and I know, Wendy, we've talked about this over the last couple of years, like you're saying, you want to start a program that's going to out, out, actually help support and train and continue, because if they're not in the business of family offices for two years, how can they excel? How can they learn it? How can they grow in it? How can they nurture it? Because of the education process. So let's do everything we can to, to make sure that from moving forward, that we amplify what everyone else is doing, what we know that's in our line of our missions to supporting women in all economic classes, because the more we can educate the family offices, like what Marty's talking about, into opportunities that they can help sustain the family unit uh, as a love of life of their children, because they're much more the intergenerational or much more philanthropy style, I'll call it, that, and they're changing their dynamics and how we can cure that. Um, I think we have a game changer. I really do because it's time. We have the audience now. We're mm -hmm. in a box, right? We have the focus. And now as we, as Wendy said, we're getting out to, we're moving out into society now. We have the joy of being able to go and talk to someone if it's not every day, but we have the opportunity. What did we learn from the pandemic is we need to act now and not wait. Well, yeah, I'll do it in 10 years. It's no, now is the time. And you know, what's really kind of cool is, I mean, Wendy, she experiences this, Marty, I'm sure you do because you deal in philanthropy, but do you know how many women are trust fund babies? And because they have a board of advisors that are all men, they're not allowed to use the money to invest in certain investments without the board giving them permission. And they assume because they're a woman, they don't know how to make the right choice on an investment. Well, that's what I'm going back to. They always want us to talk about the Kumbaya thing. And I will tell you in Dubai, a uh, conference remained nameless. They gave me a women's panel. And I told them, I stood right on the stage. I said, this isn't going to really be the women's panel. This is the investment panel. Because all of these people up here are incredibly bright. And yeah. then we completely didn't talk about being women at all. We just talked about investments. And they mobbed the stage afterwards. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, I I'm really tired of being thought of that I can't handle investments or deal with investments because I'm a woman. That's right. I don't care that I'm a woman. It really, I don't get up in the morning and go, wow, I'm a woman. I, I don't really think about it apparently the way that so many other people do. I just, I'm me. Um, and, you know, I, I really want to reach out to a whole bunch of 30 year olds and tell them how to handle situations. Yeah. Nobody told me how to deal with it. Yeah. When I was 30, I was petrified of saying anything because I'd lose my job. I could never work in my career. Um, and I just had that conversation with somebody who was 30 and she had run into a lot of that. And I'm like, just look at them and go, yeah, no, I'm not going to happen and laugh and walk off. Um, and that doesn't even occur to women. So we just get so upset about it. And then we think about it for like three weeks and we want to kill people. And I said, you know, the thing you really need to do is just own it. You know yep. what? Maybe there is some jerk out there that will fire you for saying, hey, that was over the line. Right. But most of the times, if you just say it's over the line, they'll go, oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, they realized. But I didn't realize. Okay, no more. And they move on to something else. Well, the else thing I loved about... about... Sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, the thing I loved about what he did was he went outside of his circle and reached out to you because you have credibility that you're connected to high, powerful, smart women and ask you to help him. And I am one of the things that um, it's, it's interesting because I have a passion for trying to diversify the nonprofit boards that you see in the world. And um, it's a, it's not as easy as you think because at, not out of any bad intentions, but we tend to invite people who are in our circle and the people in our circle tend to look just like us. Yeah. So there has to be some energy around going into and, and introducing yourself into areas where, um, you know, women are that don't, that are coming from different cultures and different experiences and things, but trying to find those, those areas where that expertise is and inviting them in. And it takes time and energy. So it's interesting. I called the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and, um, spoke to a gentleman there and I said, you know, here's where I sit. I said, I am consulting with nonprofits all the time. One of my top priorities is to talk about diversity and talk about how 
we can begin changing the faces on the board because they need to reflect the community that they're serving. Yeah. And so just from that standpoint alone, but we need top talent people in order to do get this work done. And, you know, I thought I was being very articulate and very compelling. And why isn't this a fascinating conversation? And you have access to all these people in the chamber that are top level business successful people. And at the end of the conversation, he said, okay, so how about becoming a member of the chamber? I'm like, oh my God, you haven't, you're not listening to, no, like you, you're just wanting me to be. And so it, it's a long row, but I would say, Deanna, you know, part of that fabric, we've got to make sure that we're going out and, and making sure that it's a, it's a really rich fabric of all different kinds of women from everywhere too, because yeah. It can't I be agree, just to right? be elite women. And ho the whole point is we got to mentor the young girls who yeah. are going to be our future right. leaders and our future entrepreneurs. And they could be future CEOs, CFOs, or COOs of family offices telling multi-million dollar families or billion dollar families how to handle things, right? So we got to gr yeah. we gotta groom them. Just like I groom my daughters and my sons, I groom them. I've been teaching them about business. When, when I was 12 years old, I went to my father and I said, my dad's Italian, by the way. And my, and I went to my father and I said, I'm going to own a bunch of businesses. I'm going to have millions and millions of dollars. And my dad goes, what the heck are you talking about? And I said, I I'm going to run businesses. I'm going to be like you. And he says, no, you're a girl. You belong in the kitchen. And you're oh. supposed to be having babies. I said, you got the wrong daughter for that. I'm you, wow. I am you dad. My dad's an entrepreneur, right? So I said, no, that's not gonna be me. And, and I will tell you that him saying no was the thing that was the catalyst. It may have been rebellion, but I said, I'm gonna prove to you, I can do that. Deanna, and I was told the same thing, same thing that I needed to get married and have kids and girls in the family didn't go to college because my mother's brothers went to college and she was not allowed to go because she was a girl. And I said, well, that's cool. Thank God for loans and scholarships. And off I went, um, you know, but yeah, being told no was just made me more determined to do yes. it. But I, I agree with Marty wholeheartedly that we need to get, you know, we need to have that space where we say, oh, there's a board position. Look, here's 10 qualified people for that board position. And look, they, they're all different colors of the rainbow different genders. And I'm not out saying that there's not a, you know, some guy out there that wouldn't be the most suited for it. But again, let's pick this person who's suited for that position and stop trying to just pick our friends that we golf with, you know? Right. Yeah. I love this. This is unbelievable. We can talk for hours. We're already 20 minutes over, but I can tell you from the bottom yeah. of my heart, getting in this, this conversation would have never happened and for the two gentlemen to ask me, they're competing. They literally were competing to get my Rolodex for, they get the women on their boards for the SPACs and also for, in fact, I have two phone conversations later on this afternoon for those very women to fulfill those positions to make sure where they're in the, in the uh, space right now. But the idea was, is I actually had to be on a call. It was at midnight, I'll be honest with you in Clubhouse. And I was talking about the dynamics of how women can change a narrative and what's going on. And they saw my, my, compassion and, and 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 real strive to make a commitment to change and they're like okay oh my gosh you are the person who do you know and I said I'm sorry I could go endless what are you guys talking about so we put it together and at, by I'd say an hour later they were fighting in the next morning by seven o'clock in the morning I had at least five emails from both of them saying where when how what do you need what do you when what's do it and then from there it just has that's great out. so that change is we got to go to other places we got to make sure we go to a different environment and like you just said marty don't go to the normal suspects you've got to go out there and go to someone's different and changing because that's what i excel in is going to where no one else is going and go to those private events because that's what makes the change that happen because they're going to listen to you so now yeah. we got a closing mm -hmm. tip all right deanna you're first what 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 tip of the day can we give everyone in our audience that you would love to share about working as a woman in the family office okay so men and women are different right and i think that women have the greatest ability right now to to work with men where they're they become the perfect unit 
Like it's a combination of them both together, right? And instead of fighting and, and jockeying to be either an equal or above them, forget that nonsense. You know what? It's the humility. It's the, it's the way that we as women can dissect things in an emotional way that men can't. It's the way that we can see things in a different spew or, or, or a different uh, venue than they are able to see. But together, when we, when we can recognize the, the, the talents and the strengths in men and also the talents and strengths in women, and we work together, we're gonna to accomplish so much more. We're gonna change the world everywhere because we're not fighting against each other for the same position. We don't need it. It's nonsense. We don't need that. Yeah. We have a platform. We have a platform now. We have power and our power is humility. It's not to jockey and take them out. We need them. We need men just like we need other women. So this is the time to unify. Love it, love it, Wendy. Um, I'll just I'll just go back to something I said before. There are going to be people in this world that don't like you because of your race, your color, your gender. Yep. I don't care what it is. Do not go down that that hole in your life of trying yeah. killing yourself to prove to them that you're worthy. You already know you're worthy. And you're never, no matter what you do, going to prove to those people that you are worthy. So it's a, it's an energy suck. Yeah. And you've got to avoid it. And when you realize that's what you're dealing with, that no matter what you do, you're, you know, I always hear women, I hear people of color always going, I have to work three times as hard. I get it because I'm, I'm a girl. So I do get it. But for the people that you're working three times as hard to prove it to, Take that 20%, 30%, shove them to the side. Do not waste your energy. It's not going to change it. Yes. It's not going to change them. And if you take that three times the energy and put it back into the 70%, who just see you as a person, um, they will think yeah. you're phenomenal. You're going to so have great success. Stop wasting your energy trying to, per to convince people that you will never convince that you should be treated equally. Go That's hang right. out with the majority of people who don't care who and what you are and love your brain. I love it. Kudos. Right on. That's good stuff. Yeah. Marty, you're next. East Coast down, West Coast up. <laughs> okay. Newport. Woohoo. Um, you know, I would I would say at this time, especially in the family office space, that it's a really good time to do some values checking. Because, uh, you know, we're seeing with the political climate and everything going on, just it's starting to become a point of fracture with families and at that family table in those family meetings that, you know, the generational differences are showing up and it's causing tension. So, I, you know, it's, it's an area where, you know, women will excel in trying to um, help relationship build. And I, but I think even more importantly, it's a really big time to have independent people at the family table to help them navigate the conversation. So, uh, you know, I just, I, it, it just feels like it's coming up over and over again. And, you know, how do you find the common values that are shared still within the family and, you know, focus on that for a bit, but help the families understand that if you're sitting at the table and you don't agree with your parents' politics, it doesn't mean you're validating their politics by still working together as a family. So, uh, you know, I just, I think women are really, it's a space of, it's really re important for us to check in right now to make sure everybody's okay. Yeah. Because I, that, you know, I call it a planet shift. Like we've had a planet shift where it is not the same anymore. And we want to honor everybody's, own journey and they're all different especially right now powerful very good stuff. yep and powerful stuff so in closing i'd like to say in a very simple word listen we have to listen to each other we have to listen when we're at the table we have to listen just like you're at the board if i speak up and say something please listen if deanna speaks something if someone says something be present in the moment to actually listen and absorb what they're saying and don't be multitasking that, okay, yeah, I'm on my phone, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And yeah, yeah. what did you say again? Because you're not going to get the value of really what they're saying and respecting their time. That's right. And so when we're making very powerful decisions and we're trying to be present in the moment, don't allow someone's dress or 
for a mindset to change your mind, you have to be very cognizant of your time and energy. Like, like Wendy's talking about, you know, don't focus on the negativity of someone else trying to change them. <clears throat> Surround yourself with the idea that people who encourage you that are, that are part of your, your tribe to make things better. That's who you need to focus on it because they're going to elevate you exponentially several multipliers. But back to this area of that, if you listen to someone that might not agree with your values, you might learn something to make your mission or life better because you opened up your doors and heart to hear them. And yeah. unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're in a society now that we're so uh, fractured, um, even though we're globally can communicate and see everyone around the world now, we are siloed and working to where we're no longer communicating with each other in a really dynamic and true for who we are um, with data analytics and everything else. So with that, I say we've got listen, We've got to make sure to unite and help with everything we do, focus on the energy and, and make sure that we are all focusing back to reach out to everyone and connect to everyone. So with that, I wish everyone be safe and be healthy as we navigate the new world of going out and tinkering to see what that's like. And this will be available on YouTube. We were uh, not able to watch it. And we will all share it on our platforms to make sure that everyone in the masses can see it. So we will wait to see the relaunch of L. I'm so excited for it and yeah. the work we're doing behind the scenes. Yay, thank and, you. Uh, the work that's going on. So thank you for your valuable time and your friendship. And everyone have a great day and a beautiful weekend. So see you. Thanks, Desiree. Bye. Welcome. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.